So I have to tell you a little bit, little story about our, our next speaker, Dr. Taylor Manalili. So um, 2018, I had this idea that, uh, you know, since we dental are in yeah, dental Disneyland, <laughs> yeah, <career. laughs> since we are in dental Disneyland, uh, why not create a Glidewell Fellowship? And the idea is I will take some young doctor who has just completed a specialty program somewhere in the country and we'll bring that doctor to our campus. They'll learn from us and we'll learn from them and it's gonna be great. So it seems like a good idea, right? So we did this, uh, I wrote to all the deans and I got all these applicants and we chose Dr. Taylor Manalili. Well, besides being the first, first ever. Uh, fellow, she also became the last fellow. <laughs> because once she got here, there was no way we were letting her leave. <laughs> She's become such a, a critical part of our team. We learned so much from her. She's such a natural teacher. Oh, thank you. Uh, she went to dental school at Stony Brook. She did her uh, prosthodontic program there. And, uh, and then she is the Lifetime Glidewell Fellow here. So uh, <laughs> I, you're going to love this lecture. It's about putting it all together, full mouth rehabilitation, Thank it's you. all yours, Taylor. Thank you for this fabulous topic. All right. We made it. You guys made it till the end of the day. Thanks for sticking around. It's always tough being the closer of any, any program here. So thank you all for sticking, sticking through. Uh, this is a very challenging topic to present in 45 minutes. And I uh, am going to not present everything from start to finish. So you have seen a lot of these steps already today from my colleagues that have presented, from our colleagues. Some beautiful cases were shown, some really great information was provided. And a lot of that information that everyone has talked about, I utilize and kind of translate from a single unit all the way to full arches, right? So um, we're going to talk about how we put each and every pieces of the puzzles that we've talked about today together. Okay, and so the goal is we want to take someone and transform them, transform their smiles, right? And so there's different ways we can do that, and we've seen, we've seen that today on various, various levels. And so what I like to think about when I think about full, full mouth reconstructions, it can be anything from as simple as, as a patient that comes in like this with hopeless dentition, something we cannot restore, right, and we have to give them a denture, right? And so uh, my co-resident and dear friend, Dr. Swanson, opened the day up today, and she did a really beautiful lecture on the fundamentals. The fundamentals of dentures is how I approach and start every full mouth reconstruction, all right? Whether it's a removable denture, an overdenture, a fixed implant prosthesis, on teeth, full, arch, full mouth on teeth, every single case I approach with these fundamentals that Dr. Swanson talked about, the fundamentals of prep design that Dr. Duplantis talked about, right? We talk about communication. Both Dr. Patel and Dr. Barrett talked about how important it is to communicate with our patients. Photography, step by step, involving their family members. All of this I do with every single one of these patients, right? And so whether it's dentures or whether we're taking someone who has teeth maybe not the most ideal teeth, right? They want to fix their smile, but they're good teeth. We don't want to get rid of them. I love surgery, but not that much, right? So in even these situations, we still want to give them a nice, beautiful end result. And so how do we get here, right? How do we make this happen? And so where, where do I like to start? And so I think this is a good, a good, uh, place to start when we talk about full mouth rehabs, it can be very overwhelming for a lot of us, right? So when we do these full mouths, a lot of people don't know where to start. Um, there's a lot of every tooth in the mouth we have to address, right? Are we opening their vertical? Are we closing their vertical? Do we like the shape of their teeth? Do we want to shape, change the shape of their teeth? Why are we doing this full mouth rehab, right? What habits do they have that we maybe need to break or change, right? We need to educate these patients. They're in this situation for a reason. Okay, and so I can't address everything today, but I do want to address some of the big things that I get asked questions about a lot. And the first thing is actually something Dr. Swanson talked about this morning, and I want to reinforce. And to do that, I'm going to use two patients. Uh, so both of these patients I treated here at Glidewell after I started. And so we have 
Doug, who has, uh, as you can see by his smile photo, used and abused his natural dentition. And then we have Tamala here on the right-hand side, who just really wanted a nice smile upgrade, right? And so I'm starting this topic today talking about vertical dimension, because I feel like every dentist at some point that I've talked about when it comes to full mouth rehabs has asked me about vertical dimension. It seems to be this scary elephant in the room. Um, and I want to I want to talk about how I address it and how some of the things that you should think about as, as you move forward with these kind of patients. So there's three things that I like to look at. And so I like to look at uh, intraocclusal distance, vertical dimension of rest, and occlusal vertical dimension. And all of these go hand in hand, right? And so this is going back to maybe dental school for some of you guys, basic denture principles. How do we set up a denture? We have to figure out our VDO, VDR minus VDO equals interocclusal distance, right? So we have to go through all this. So interocclusal distance, another term, maybe you might have heard one of these other terms thrown around here. So we have our rest dif distance, our clearance, our gap, the freeway space perhaps, I think that's a pretty common one, and then rest space. So all of these terms mean the same thing, right? We just want to figure out what that distance is in between the teeth, okay? So the main thing, the main goal of any full mouth rehab, right? We want our patients to be comfortable and we need them to function. So this is an aesthetic symposium. We obviously want things to be beautiful, but most importantly, they need to be comfortable and functional, whatever we give them, okay? So again, I'm referencing the GPT, just like Dr. Swanson did. I have a few of these in here. So the, the glossary of prosthodontic terms. So what is, so it just, interocclusal distance means the vertical dimension of rest minus the vertical dimension of occlusion, and that gives us this distance. And so on average, most of our patients have about three millimeters of space. Okay, this is an average. A lot of us function at higher distance than this. Some of us function at a lower distance than this. Okay, so what comes to mind? So this can be challenging, right? How do we figure this out? So there's different ways we can figure this out. The easiest way to kind of describe this, and you've all done this before in your practice, right? You've all restored a denture case, right? I bring back, back Jimmy. So we've all restored a denture case. When you restore a denture case, you have to figure out what that interocclusal distance is, right? You are doing things like testing phonetics. You are, what Dr. Swanson was talking about, setting up those teeth so the patient, when they chew and bite, they're pushing food on top of the teeth, right? That is all part of functioning and figuring out that interocclusal distance. So for me, dentures are a very easy way or easy uh, restorative situation to figure out that distance, okay? We use our wax rims, we adjust the wax rims, we let them test it, right? They smile, they speak. We can even, nowadays, we can even give them like a trial denture to wear in the digital world, right? They can test it. And so, 54, doesn't need to be sound, but there is. That's okay. So you can hear them speaking. So just Dr. Swanson had a slide this morning of counting. So I do this with all of my cases. Dentures, full arch fixed. I want to test their phonetics. So the two easy things I have them do, I count in the 50s. So 50 to 60 counts, you uh, assess their fricative sounds. So that'll assess the anterior tooth position, right? And then I have them go through their 60s through 70s. And that'll help me assess that freeway space in the posterior. Okay, so having them run through and count whether you're increasing vertical, decreasing vertical, in dentures, in fixed, however you wish to do it, this is a very easy way to look. So if you look at the far, let's see, what side am I on? If you look at the far right side of the screen, uh, you can see, so he's saying his S's. And so by just looking straight down, you can get an idea of how much freeway space that patient has. And if we need to close or open it, if you're violating that. So as they're speaking, if they're not having a ton of clearance in there, you probably violated that freeway space. Give them a little bit more room. Okay, so it's really easy to restore someone when they have a ton of freeway space. It can be a little uh, iffy if their teeth are very close together, okay? So regardless of the situation, and I'm gonna reinforce this multiple times today, you want to trial it, okay? These are big cases, they have to test it, okay? Articulators are great. Virtual articulators are great. Everything we do now is wonderful. Nothing is better 
than the patient articulator, right? So every time I do a full mouth rehab, dentures, fixed teeth, they have to trial their smile, right? They have to try it out. Function, aesthetics, all of it. Okay, so the other part of vertical dimension, another part, resting vertical, okay? So, what is the resting vertical? So when a patient is sitting upright in a relaxed position, that is, uh, in their mandible hanging, that is technically their resting position. There's a lot of literature out there that kind of references, does this vertical ever change in a patient's life, right? So a lot of it, there's not really a lot of literature to support that it does change, but what do we know? We know as time goes on, the skeletal features change over time. If we're, as we get older, sometimes our muscle tone decreases. Times of COVID, we've all seen in our offices, patients get really stressed and muscle tone increases, right? We have a lot of bruxers and clenchers right now. Perfect example of one on the screen here, right? And so we see these muscles can change that vertical dimension of rest a little bit, right? So we wanna make sure we understand how to get the patient there. So learning how to deprogram your patients, getting them into a relaxed position, and then testing them there, making sure that they can maintain that position. Okay, these are all very important things. And so understanding those can help us get a correct vertical dimension of occlusion. So Dr. Swanson pointed this out, so I won't spend too much time on this, but how we measure our vertical. So when a patient is in maximum intercuspation, you're taking two facial measurements. So I like to measure the base of the nose and either the edge of the lip or the, the tip of the chin. So two easy measurements I can always go back to. And that is how I measure the existing vertical dimension, or if I open it, how I'm gonna measure the new vertical dimension. And so this is the question I'm always asked. If we alter the vertical, will we harm our patients, right? And I think even Dr. Swanson said this, I'm referencing her a lot. You can tell we went to residency together, we're good friends, right? And so we think, we think a lot alike. And so if you properly diagnose your patient and properly go through this treatment planning steps, there's been a lot of literature out there. When you open your patient, close your patient, doesn't really cause a lot of harm. They get used to it, right? Two weeks and everything kind of adjusts. Now, if we violate and open them way too much, sure, you can cause them harm. If they have existing issues with their joints and issues you don't properly diagnose in the beginning, sure, you can absolutely exacerbate some of those issues. But if their joints are healthy and you properly treatment plan the situation, everything usually turns out just fine. Alrighty, so how do we diagnose and treatment plan? And so this is an aesthetic symposium, so I'm gonna talk about how I aesthetically diagnose and treatment plan these patients. And then of course we have to talk a little bit about functional. Alrighty, so let's start off with aesthetics. So when we see our patient Tamala come in, without even looking in her mouth, I like to start to plan my full mouth rehab. Right, so I'm gonna look at her face, her overall facial features. So we talked a little bit today about facial thirds. And so I actually use that same instrument, the Comedier video gauge, which measures facial thirds. It was shown earlier today, right? And so it measures from the pupils of the eyes to the commissure of the lips. And I take that measurement and that should relatively match, that third should relatively match from the base of the nose to the tip of the chin. So when we look at her, she's pretty symmetrical. So there's not really an outright need to open her from an aesthetic point of view. And this is really important. So we look at this from the, from the frontal view as well as from the profile view. And so her, we're probably gonna maintain this vertical, right? When we look at Doug, our other patient, when we're looking at this, there's some signs on his face that make me think we're probably gonna wanna open him a little bit. So this is without me even looking in his mouth, right? You can just tell from his facial features, he looks a little overclosed, perhaps, right? Perhaps. And so we take our measurements, and sure enough, the lower third of his face could use a little, a little uh, opening, right? And so we're gonna try in our head to open him. I know right away I wanna add some, some height to this. Okay. And so aesthetically, this is how I assess vertically if I'm doing this. So what if we do over-open the patient? And so there's some, been some great articles about this of just 
This is a case where a patient is obviously overopened, right? And so in this case, we know just from a profile perspective, any lay person would probably notice this too, but we notice her mentalis is really, is really scrunched, right? Her lips are pursed. So she, she looks like she's like a mouthful of marbles, right? And so you know that this patient is overopened. And so if this were a denture patient, it's very easy to fix. If it's a, if it's a fixed patient, you may have to consult ortho, surgery, something, right? You'd have to consult your colleagues. But you know right away this is a patient you're going to want to close and not just put restorations in their mouth. All right. And so this is the gauge that I do like to use. And I love to use this. Uh, very, very simple. So I use this for all of my full mouth rehabs, removable through fixed. And so again, it, this, uh, this portion locks in. So you measure the upper third, so eyes to, to lips. You lock that in, and then it helps you gauge that lower area. Now, does everyone's face perfectly symmetrical? No. This is just something I use to gauge the situation. It doesn't mean I'm always going to follow this, right? But it does help me. So I'll use this in combination with a leaf gauge you see here. So I'm doing full mouth. I want to get them into a nice repeatable bite. So it allows me to open them a little bit. With the leaf gauge, I can take an open bite registration. You see is in there with the leaf gauge. So it allows me to get the vertical that I need in the relationship of the jaws. So if I need to deprogram them and, and put them into a CR position, they can easily flow back into that position. So this is a really invaluable tool that I love to use. As far as function goes, so again, let's use Doug, because he has used and abused his dentition. So he's easy to talk about with function, right? So we see, we see someone like this in our practice, and there's a few things that automatically come to my mind, right? So if we, if we kind of zoom in, we see he obviously has had some, some sort of parafunctional habit for quite a while now. He has uh, done a number on his natural dentition. And so this is always a red flag when I'm in my treatment planning phase, right? So this is someone who I'm automatically going to think of a couple things, right? I see chipped teeth. I see there's obvious occlusal changes, so I want to know has that created any muscle problems? Did he have muscle problems that have created the occlusal changes, right? Are his joints OK? So these are all things I'm looking at before I even touch him, right? This is all the in the diagnosis and treatment planning phase. And so let's look at the first thing, so the chip teeth. So if I'm thinking of chip teeth, I'm going to refer back to Dr. Chi's lecture from earlier, right? The materials lecture, and I want to know that's probably a patient I'm not going to do any sort of bilayered material on, right? This is something I want to do a monolithic restoration. I don't want him coming back in and start chipping off his porcelain on this beautiful, nice work that we just did, right? And so if someone has those habits, I'm really going to be mindful of the material I'm using, monolithic material, and something that can withstand if for some reason he ever gets back into those habits, right, or continues to have those habits. OK, so be mindful of the materials. So let's go back to the outside of his face, right? And so without even looking at his mouth, we looked at maybe we want to open his vertical, just aesthetically from proportions. But what else do we see? We see his mentalis is strained. We see those labial folds. He has that curved down look, right? That's all a signal that I probably want to open him up a little bit. All right, what else do I see? So the other thing that stands out to me on a lot of these patients is you see their masseters are overbulked, right? And so that's a really good sign that they're working hard. They're doing a really good job, and that's where I might call in Mary to come, Dr. Shields to come in and give a little Botox to this patient, right? And this is something I've actually took her course a couple years ago, right? And so I do Botox a lot of my patients for this purpose. So here in California, it's like skirting the line with, has to be dental related, right? For, so uh, I do this for a lot, of my, um, a lot of my masseter patients that I need to tone down. So I will Botox them. So keeping that in mind, right, we need, to, we need to look at that. So aesthetically, we know we want to alter him. Functionally, we know we need to do something, right? He's worn his dentition down. We have to change him functionally. So what do I like to do when I'm doing these full mouth rehabs? So for fixed restorations, when I, am, when I have the pleasure of reconstructing everyone, I do like to use, I put a picture of my dog up here because it's easy to remember, right? Canine guidance. So I like to do this mutually protected occlusion. 
Okay, so why is this good? So especially with someone with those massive, massive masseters, right? They're, they're putting stress on that teeth. I want to take power. So not only give them Botox, but I want to take away power from their masseters. So I want to give them guidance off their canines. It's going to give a lot less force factors to their posterior teeth, right? Their posterior teeth protect the anterior teeth. Anterior teeth protect the posterior teeth. So that's great for fixed. I don't like to do that for my removable cases. So for removable cases, bringing it back to dental school gives me PTSD from cross residency, balancing dentures. But I do, <laughs> Dr. Swanson still does it. But <laughs> the lab does it now for me. So I like to, <laughs> so I like to do balanced occlusion, right? So we want to do something that's going to prevent the dentures from tipping. And so how does this break down? So basically, if I'm doing any sort of pure removable denture opposing anything else, I'm doing balanced occlusion. If I am doing any sort of uh, fixed on fixed, whether it's teeth or implants, I am going to do a mutually protected occlusion. So very, very simple, straightforward with that. Okay, so we're gonna switch gears a little bit. That's a big topic, so I'm trying to cover different angles here. Okay, so we have Aesthetically determine we're going to open him uh, through Dr. Barrett. We have done our, I'm going to play around here. So through Dr. Barrett, we have done our wax up, our intraoral trial your smile, right? So we see what we like. We've taken pictures. We've talked to them and their families. And now we really want to send them home to try it out, right? We've prepped the teeth. Maybe we have them in some provisionals. And so you got to test, take it for a test run. You got to send them home. You got to make sure they function with it, okay? So you got to make sure their family likes the aesthetics. You got to make sure they can eat with it. So I just don't want them to speak in my office. So we have patients that I will send a lot of these patients home, and I will say, if your speech sounds funny at first, especially new denture wearers or someone new, right? They have a lot of hard time with that. Send them home. In the morning, you read the paper, you read a book. Everyone reads something every morning, right? We look at our phone for hours every day. Spend a couple minutes. Go by yourself somewhere in a room. Speak out loud to yourself. Read your article that you read every morning. Read it out loud for 10, 15 minutes. And see if over the next week or two, you adapt to it. Tell me what sounds sound funny, what sounds sound OK, right? Sometimes they just need a little adjustment period. And so really trialing that out for a good couple weeks a lot of those initial issues go away, right? So Dr. Swanson was saying this morning, two weeks. Generally, after two weeks, everyone can adapt. It's pretty true. So about two weeks, two to four weeks, I usually give my patients with their provisionals to come back and tell me what they like and don't like. All right? And so you can see, sometimes right off the bat, I know what I like and don't like, right? So provisionals, this was round one with Doug. I mean, he's still numb in this picture. But as we zoom in, you can see there are things I really don't like. So I picked the wrong shade. That's on me, right? I don't like that. It's not a nice shade, but you can see his smile, his occlusal plane of his upper is a little slightly off, right? There's little things I don't like. But this gives me an opportunity to go back and fix that. And I always want them to trial the smile they're going to go home with. So I don't have them try this for two weeks and say, OK, I'm going to tell the lab, treat number nine in the final and fix this, and then we're just going to go for it. No, I put them in another round of temporaries and I let them go home. I want them to be happy with it. No one wants to pay for a full mouth lab bill that they have to redo, right? So I'm happily pay or do some more temporaries for my patient all day, right? So I want them to be happy before we go to the finals. This also gives me an opportunity. I like to use my temporaries as a prep check. So as dentists, we really like to do conservative dentistry. So Dr. Duplantis said earlier, he does not like to do no prep veneers. I don't either. They're very bulky. But I also want to make sure whatever, whatever restoration I'm restoring with, whatever material I choose, I give myself enough room. So whether this is a single unit or a full arch, take a caliper. Measure your temporary. If your temporary doesn't fit the minimal thickness or minimal requirement for what the final material is going to be, cut down your tooth a little bit more. Okay? It goes a long way. And so I do like to use these provisionals for multiple things. OK. So provisionals are in. Everyone's happy. And now the dreaded full arch impression. Right? None of us like to do these. I still, well, I don't anymore. But 
I used to cringe all the time having to do these, right? These are a pain. If anyone's uh, tried to do this, if you missed a tooth, you have to go in, take another impression, it's terrible, right? And so our goal in all of this, right, our goal for single units to full arch, you need to capture a little bit of tooth structure beyond your margin, okay? So if you can't see it and you were present when you drilled the tooth, the lab technician who's 2,000 miles away from you and has never met the patient is never going to find your margin, okay? So you really need to make sure you make it crystal clear, all right? And so to do that, uh, especially today, so I get, I get asked a lot, and this may be very obvious to some of you in the audience, but I get asked a lot, so I switched over to digital. I scan all my patients now. Like, I don't have to pack cord anymore, right? That's a very common question I get asked, and that may seem silly to some of you. Um, but no, scanners cannot see under the soft tissue, okay? So even when you do scan a patient, you still have to properly retract the tissue. Okay, so I like to use a double cord technique whenever there is room for it, um, especially in my full mouth rehab cases. Okay, I like to do, whenever I'm doing a full arch impression, I like to pack a smaller cord first, followed by a larger cord. So the little cord will vertically retract, so it can, if you need to refine anywhere your margins are, it'll push that tissue a little apically to do a little subgingival refinement without damaging the tissue. And then you can use a slightly larger cord to horizontally retract and push that tissue away, exposing the maybe the root or the underlying tooth structure beyond your margin, right? And so you don't, I'm gonna go back one. So you, you see that the cord doesn't need to be tucked under. You wanna see the cord, right? You don't want it to disappear into the sulcus. Um, you don't need to fill the sulcus. The goal is you just need to push the tissue away from the top half a millimeter to a millimeter beyond your margin, right? And so that is the goal. So one thing with a full mouth rehab, you are doing 14 teeth in an arch, do not soak the bottom cord, okay? So if you soak the bottom cord and leave that cord in there for an extended period of time, all right, you're gonna get some ischemia to the tissue, or you're gonna get recession. And so that bottom cord I like to leave nice and dry, it stays in during the impression, and then the top cord, if you need to soak it a little bit, you can. Um, I do like to try to get control all the ways that Dr. G, a couple others were talking about earlier first, but that is something with full mouths, do not soak that bottom cord. Okay, so digital versus conventional. I am 100% digital now, it took me a little while, but now I love it. So Dr. Chi laughs at me, because when I came, I still did all of my impressions with my PVS, and I refused to switch over, and uh, one day he convinced me to do it, and I kick myself for not doing it the day I started here. So. You know, with conventional, when we do these full mouths, you have to capture 14 teeth. If you miss one or two, you gotta retake the impression. And then the lab has to sit there and mold the two models together. Good luck getting that to be perfect, right? It's, it's a lot of work and there's a lot of room for error. Um, and it's a lot of time in your chair, right? If you don't do it right away, you gotta repack cord. It could be like an extra 30, 40 minutes to just like capture another tooth. It's miserable. So with digital, so I apologize, this, is a, uh, this was taken like the, day, the first day I was playing around with the scanner, so I'm, I'm just figuring out, but you can see. So this is double cord, so we're removing the top cord, right? And then we're gonna go ahead and we start scanning. So I'm learning how to use the scanner in this video, so I apologize. This is my new Medit that I get to play with. And so what I love about this though, right? And so. We scan the patient, and then there's a couple areas, or there's an area here that I didn't capture well, okay? So at the very end, we're gonna go in, so we're scanning everything, we can see our margins in real time. So if I can't see it clearly, I know the lab's not gonna see it, right? And so if you capture any excess data, or you miss something, what I love about digital is you can just repack cord in that one little area and rescan that one area, right? And so after we're done scanning the arch, we'll go back in and you notice there's a little extra material there. And I'm gonna go through and with my eraser button, I'm going to erase the data in that one specific area, right? So we see a little extra, extra data hanging out. So we're gonna go through 
I, I, I don't know why I didn't start doing this years ago. It really is sad to me. But so you're going to go through and you just erase that one little section. And so what used to take me 30 minutes when I made a mistake like this now takes me about five minutes with processing of the scan, right? And so you go through, you erase, and then you just quick click rescan, and then it rescans that one section that you missed. I wonder how many hours of my lifetime I would have saved if I had this years ago. All right. So the other elephant in the room that I want to talk about is shade. Okay, so shade is a challenge we all have. This is an aesthetic symposium. We can't not talk about shade a little bit. And so challenges with shade we all have. In our offices, everyone talks about this, right? We have lighting, selection time, position of the patient, position of you, position of the shade tab. Do you take the shade in the beginning of the appointment? At the end of the appointment, is the tooth desiccated? Uh, is, are you far enough away, right? Like you're supposed to be one arm's length away. I don't really know that many dentists that do that. We all get like up close. We like to invade personal space, right? Uh, digital images, right? So we all say, send a picture to the lab. It'll show the lab exactly what you want. Pictures and shade don't really go hand in hand, right? So they change the shade a little bit. It communicates some information, but it's not perfect, okay? There have been so many papers written on what to do and how to take shade. I'm not going to go through these because I am talking about full mouth rehabs, right? So we don't need to do a lot of that. Um, what we need to do is listen to what Dr. Barrett said earlier, right? So we need to communicate with our patients, right? We need to have a conversation. What are their goals, right? I never do this. I never give them a shade tab or have the shade tab on the counter. Um, I work with a lot of lab technicians, so that is a downfall. They, a lot of my patients are lab technicians, so they already know. But... <laughs> Traditionally, I do not hand them a shade guide, right? I want them, I want to pick the shade first and show them a couple options based on a conversation we had. Okay, so I want to, we're going to continue with this in a second, but one of the big challenges I think with full mouth rehabs that we have is matching, so we're doing multiple teeth, like multiple different restorations. So one situation I had recently that was a particular chal particularly challenging was a case where we did veneers. He had a combination of veneers, missing a tooth, so he had a pontic, and then crowns. It is all in the anterior. That's like a nightmare to try to restore, right? You have to, you have to somehow communicate that shade and hope and pray that the lab gets that right. And so I wanted to put this up here just to express how important it is to make sure you reduce enough for the lab. Make sure you have enough room for the material that you want to use, okay? Make sure you pick a material that's gonna properly hide what's underneath that, right? And so when you finish this and you look at this, you look at them in person, the shades blend really nicely. So if you give them enough room to put that material in there, you can get away with it, okay? All right, so most of our patients, including that one just there, come in the office and this is what they ask me for. They want something that if I put their head next to the John, they would match nicely, right? And so I don't like this. I like natural smiles. Uh, I like when you look at someone and you can't really tell that they have their teeth done. It just, their smile just looks beautiful, right? And so this is so important. So I keep saying this, but really communication with your patients and full mouth rehabs go a long way. And that's, we all know this with denture patients, fix patients too, right? And so what I like to do for selecting shades, so there's been studies done on this, right? How do we select shades? And so this study was done by Dr. Jay Hungary out of NYU. And so they, they looked at a bunch of their patients. These are natural tooth shades, right? So natural, nice smiles. And they basically found, which makes a lot of sense, right? So Patients with a darker skin tone, darker to medium skin tones, look much more, have much more natural smiles with lighter value teeth. And people with pale and light skin tones, it looks very natural when they have a darker value tooth. So if we translate this over, so how do I, so what I like to do, so in our office we have one shade tab that we put in value order, okay? 
So we put it in value order, not the way that it's normally there, but we put it in value order and it makes it very easy to select a shade for your patient. So I'll be honest, I'm never really going into, when I do full mouth rehabs, I'm really staying in the beginning of the shade tab area. And I'm saying B1, A1, A2. No one really wants a full mouth rehab and is like, give me a C3. Uh, no one wants that, right? So we are staying this way, but it does make a big difference. So I want to show you th these three patients that we've talked about today. So we have Tamala. So she's got a darker skin tone, right? So she's someone we actually went with a bleach shade on her. She had an OM1. And it looks beautiful, right? Doug in the middle here, he's got like a medium skin tone. He was an A1, and it still looks nice on him. And then Jimmy here, he's actually an A2, right? But he looks, it makes his skin tone, he doesn't look as pale and washed out if I gave him an OM1. So it makes a big difference in the shade you give the patient. Not every patient needs that bleach shade to make it look natural and beautiful and white. Okay, so we have one more thing we're gonna cover. And so we've picked our shade, we've taken our impressions, and now delivery day. So Dr. Bender did a great job at explaining the different ways we can cement our crowns. Dr. G actually, I think, showed a couple of videos on him cementing some larger cases. And so I just, I get asked, how do I cement these full arch cases? And so I actually stole the slide from Dr. Bender, where I, I think, and so one of the things I do not use in full mouth rehabs is I do not use conventional cements. Okay, um, they are, they tend to be fairly uh, opaque white cements and it's just, it's hard to control, right? And so I like to use either a self-adhesive or even better, an adhesive cement when I'm doing a lot of restorations at once, right? You want the control to be able to put these in and not have things setting on you and it's a, it's a big mess, right? I also really like these cements because they come with try-in paste. And so when you're doing these really aesthetic cases, you can use a try-in paste to make sure that everything is gonna look good, right? So I like to have them look at the finals with the actual try-in paste in. Okay. So will this play? Yes, so this is a case that we're bonding in. And so, etch the teeth, put our desensitizer on, put our adhesive on, air thin it, all like Dr. Bender talked about. And now we're gonna go ahead and get ready to cement these in. And so what I like to do is you wanna start with the centrals and move your way back, okay? I think we've, we've both done this once because I know we've cried about it. But when you, when you do this, you do not wanna start on one side cement the whole side and then try to cement the other, right? If we do that, inevitably one of them is not going to fit. And if one of them doesn't fit, I don't care if it's the molar, right? If I have to go back in and adjust occlusal contacts between a premolar and a molar or my first molar and my second molar, I'm okay with that. I don't wanna start recontouring eight and nine because I let cement set and let, let the teeth cure when they weren't in the right positions, right? So you want to make sure you start in the front and work your way back. And this is the same with the mirrors, full coverage restoration. You're just going to start and work your way backwards. Okay? All right. And that is the biggest thing. And so I'm just going to say this has been a really great day. I know it's been a long day for you guys. And I, I want to say thank you for hanging in and hanging out with us. Um, this is an aesthetic day, right? And so facial aesthetics are so important for everything from single teeth to full mouth. So really, really assess the patient's facial aesthetics. Do some Botox on the patient, right? She even did it on me. All right. Uh, test drive. So aesthetic cases. Partial coverage, full coverage, single unit, to full mouth. Let your patients trial it out, okay? It makes a really, really big difference. Uh, communicate with your patients. Patients are so much happier when you talk to them about all of these things. Tell them the issues you might perceive. So identifying a lot of those problems during the treatment planning phase and openly talking to them about what issues you might think you're gonna come, come across throughout the treatment, it makes them mentally handle it a lot better. I've had a denture patient that came to me and his one wish was to chew and bite an apple. And I left. 
and I said, you are probably never, unfortunately, you're probably never going to bite into an apple again. A month after I delivered his dentures, he showed up with an apple to show me that he could bite, because he just wanted to prove me wrong, right? Like, you put that in someone's head, and it's managing their expectations, right? And so even when full mouth, we have to be really, really have to be the one in control. So test everything, make sure everything is. All right, with that, thank you guys for hanging out.